the tiger. It had been a rough year for the Lore family. Almost half a year ago, their father, Shuajir, was rushed to the hospital for a stroke. While there, it was discovered his kidneys were failing and operating at 5%. Upon his release, he was advised to start dialysis. Despite his family's pleas, the man declined. You all want me dead, dead like your uncle Ying. He got dialysis, and where is he now? Buried in the dirt, Jer told his family. Not long afterward, the man broke his hip and busted his head when he fell down the stairs. Jer was treated for his injuries, but his stay was prolonged since surgery was needed to repair his hip. Further examination concluded the old man suffered additional minor strokes since his initial one. The family felt bad and looked at one another in disbelief. Detecting strokes can be difficult to the untrained eye, especially the minor ones. It's the major ones we have to be aware of. You did a great job of recognizing it and bringing him in when you did, the doctor said trying to put their mind at ease. Truth was, the issue started long before then. Jur had a heart attack two years prior, which resulted in the medical staff putting several stints in his heart. The man was never the same since. Jur used to wake up before everyone in his family, looking for things to work on around the house. He did anything from washing dishes to yard work. He even went on walks around the neighborhood when there was nothing to do. After his operation, the man became a shell of himself. He couldn't exert himself like he used to and became increasingly less active. The more effort he put in, the more exhausted he became with little to no difference in whatever he was doing. Everything Jer tried to do seemed like a chore he started, but couldn't finish. The less active he was, the more discouraged he became. Jer felt like he'd lost all purpose in life as a man and a father. It got to the point where he'd often sit around the house with the family, but was never fully engaged. His wife Gia, or even his children who were now adults, would address him, but the man wouldn't know it until they physically made contact with him or called him several times, in which case he turned to them looking like he'd just awakened from a dream. He was the same during outings and at church. The family figured it was due to his age. However, it was after his first major stroke when things really took a turn for the worst. Before it, the old man was warm and compassionate. He even had a great sense of humor, and often joked around with his kids and grandkids. Afterward, he became mean-spirited and hostile. On many occasions, Xuanzhou said he saw a strange man lurking around the house and accused Gia of cheating on him with the man. One time, while the family was in the living room watching TV after dinner, Xuanzhou had a major episode in front of the whole family. You think I don't see you there? You can't hide from me. Are you not embarrassed? Leave my wife alone. If you don't, you're going to be sorry, the old man yelled. Alarmed, everyone turned to see what the commotion was about. Even the old man's grandchildren were frightened. Who are you yelling at? Gia asked. Your boyfriend. Who else? He better leave, because if he doesn't, I'm going to kill him, exclaimed Jer. What are you talking about? There's no one here except us, Gia shouted back. Don't lie, he's right there, the man shouted, pointing to a corner of the room. Everyone glanced over, only to see the usual wooden end table with the lamp on it. There's no one there, the old woman fired back. The two went back and forth until he snatched a handful of the woman's hair and tossed her onto the floor beneath him like a gator dragging its prey into water. The move was so quick and sudden, it caught her and everyone else by surprise. He then proceeded to punch her in the head and face all the while the old woman screamed in agony. Their son Tuo rushed over to stop his enraged father from beating his mother. They've argued before, especially since the stroke, but he had never seen his father lay a finger on his mother. Growing up, neither of his parents ever spanked or beat Tuo or his siblings. Dad, stop! Tuo yelled, attempting to bear hug his father from behind. The old man was much stronger than Tua anticipated. Jer thrashed around violently like a crazed beast, 
freeing his punching arm from his son's hold, all the while still clutching tightly to his wife's hair as she screamed. His flailing elbow cracked Tua in the mouth, staggering him backward. Meanwhile, Shannon, Tua's wife, tried desperately to free her mother-in-law from her father-in-law's insane grip. "'Dad, stop! Let Mom go!' Shannon pleaded. But her pleas fell on deaf ears. The old man shoved her with a kick, sending her tumbling to the floor. Everywhere around them, the grandkids were either crying or staring in horror as the adults continued their battle royale. Unperturbed by the blood drizzling from his mouth, Toa once again tried to restrain his father, this time with more determination. Hurry! Get Mom! Toa shouted. Shannon scrambled back to her feet at once and was back in the fight, trying desperately to pry her mother-in-law free from her assailant. Unable to use his arms, the old man attempted to kick her again, but Shannon was ready that time, and his attacks were unsuccessful. Tua wrestled his father to the floor as the elderly man growled and roared like a ravenous dog. At one point, he even tried to bite his own son. Shannon finally got her mother-in-law free, but not before losing several strands of hair. After a moment, the old man's strength subsided and he calmed down. Only then did Tua let his father go. The whole ordeal lasted no longer than a couple of minutes, but it was far too long for those involved. Though the old man was no longer physical, he was still very much vocal. He continued ranting and raving like a madman, threatening to call relatives to lecture the family for abusing him and his wife's non-existent infidelity. Gia was shaken up, but other than some bumps and bruises and a major headache, she was fine. Tua called his siblings right away, informing them of what transpired. They separated their mother and father for almost two weeks, with Gia having to temporarily live at one of her other children's houses. Unfortunately, Xuanzhou continued to have similar episodes, forcing his wife to leave time and time again. Whenever the old woman had to leave her husband, Gia always felt really guilty for leaving him alone. She'd often phone home and spoke with Tua, making sure Jer had enough food to eat or was taking his medicines. Sometimes, when she spoke with her husband on the phone, he'd cry, saying he missed her. Other times, he was mean, threatening her with abuse and telling her he was going to call upon his relatives to lecture her. It was the same when she returned home. Some days were better than others, and sometimes she'd be forced to sleep in one of the grandkids' rooms downstairs. That was how life went for a time. Worried their father may potentially fall down the stairs since the old man was mentally unwell and wasn't as coordinated as he used to be, Tua and his siblings tried talking their father into staying in one of the rooms downstairs, but Xuanzhou was adamant about keeping his room where it was. Frustrated, they let the man be until his inevitable accident. Two weeks passed by since Xuanzhou's fall. All his injuries had been treated for including the surgery to address his broken hip a few days ago. The old man was currently in the recovery ward, sound asleep. It was late at night. The visitors from church and relatives were long gone. Beside him sat two women, his daughters Ndo and B. They were keeping each other company while watching over their father. Ndo was on Facebook browsing through Mong Ti, while her sister watched over a woman on livestream showcasing the newest and most fashionable traditional Hmong outfits. Wow, this one's hecka cute. Wished the trim was green, though, B said. It would have been the perfect outfit to go with the hat I have at home. Yeah, that one's okay, said Do, glancing over her sister's phone. Well, I like it. Why couldn't it have been green, though? B sighed. The sisters went back and forth, about the dress and what each of them had in their collection when they were interrupted by a rattle. Both of them immediately looked up at their father. The old man had both hands clenched tightly around each side of the railings. His eyes were still closed, but his brows were drawn back and furrowed. It looked like the old man was attempting to open his eyes, but his eyelids were sewn shut. Xuanzhe whippered and began stirring in his sleep. All the while his hands remained gripped to the railings, he licked his lips, then a chilling inhuman sound escaped him, sounding like some sort of beastly call. Run! Run to see if you'll get away. 
You'll never escape a tiger, the old man said. Both sisters looked at one another, wide-eyed, then back at their father, goosebumps running through each of their skin. B swallowed hard as she got up to wake her father from his slumber. D Dad, what's going on? She asked, her voice trembling. B reached a hand out to wake her father when the man's eyes flew open, exposing the whites of them. His lips curled as he let out a low growl and lunged for her. <laughs> Screaming, B reeled back and would have fell had her sister not caught her. Though he was now sitting up, he didn't pursue or climb out of bed after her. Instead, remained there snarling and growling, clawing and snapping at the air, almost as if attacking something neither woman could see. As fast as he sat up, the old man froze for a second, with both arms extended, then plopped back onto his pillow, as if nothing happened at all. Terrified, the sisters held one another without a peep for what seemed like an eternity. A knock came from the door behind the two women, startling them. It opened, and a female nurse walked in. We thought we heard a scream from this room. Is everything okay? She asked, studying the sisters. Daru and B both told her about what happened, and the nurse said she'd report it to the doctor to see what should be done. She added their dad shouldn't be sitting up so suddenly since he just had surgery, and to let her know if it happened again. After making sure all the man's vitals were okay, the nurse left. The sisters were so afraid they didn't sleep for the rest of the night. The next day, their father seemed like his normal self. They also informed the family regarding what occurred the night before and they had a prayer session led by their pastor in Jer's room later that day. The following night, the medical staff had to put restraints on the old man after he attacked a nurse and was trying to bite her. He was more or less the same for the rest of his stay at the hospital. Some days were better than others. The Lores were notified their father's kidneys were failing and only operating at 1% and that the cause of his sporadic behavior may be due to the toxins in his body in conjunction to the stroke he suffered. The medical staff advised the family the only way to prolong their father's life was to have him do dialysis, but warned he may not survive it because of his current state. If he did, his quality of life wouldn't be too good. Xuanzhou eventually got out of the hospital and started undergoing dialysis. Since he couldn't walk, a bed was set up for him downstairs in the living room, which made it easier to transport him for dialysis. Because he couldn't walk to the bathroom, diapers were put on him, and other family members had to clean and change him. The Lores also had a portable mattress set up beside their dad, in case he happened to need assistance in the middle of the night, and they each took turns watching over him. During that time, Jur occasionally had similar episodes to the one at the hospital with B and Do. It was always a frightening experience for everyone present whenever he had them. They mostly always happened late at night, so none of the church members nor the pastor ever experienced them. One night, while Kia and Shannon had fallen asleep during their watch, Kia woke up to her husband making strange noises. One thing was for sure, it didn't sound human in the least. The sounds sent a chill down her spine. Though it was dark in the room, they did have a nightlight. It provided just enough light to see what was happening. Her husband was sitting upright, cradling something in both hands and baring his teeth. What was that, a baby? Kia wondered. As her vision adjusted to the limited illumination, she could tell it was a pillow. His pillow. She could also sparsely make out the reflection from the whites of the man's eyes and was reminded of what her daughters told her. He let out a low growl and bit into his pillow. The man ripped off a chunk of it, like a wild animal feasting on the corpse of its prey and began chewing on it. Gia gulped hard, trying to swallow the huge knot forming in her throat. She wanted to wake her daughter-in-law for help, but the old lady couldn't force her body to move. She didn't even want to breathe, so she sat there, trembling in the dim light of the room. Suddenly, the old man stopped chewing on the pillow to sniff the air. He spat out the piece from his mouth and spoke. What is it? How come it smells so good? The old man said, licking his chops. I'm going to hunt you down and eat you. The old man leapt from the bed onto the couple below. Gia let out a blood-curdling scream. A split second later, Jer was screaming in pain and yelling for help. Tua heard the ruckus and hurried to the living room. 
Flicking on the light, he found his dad with half his body dangling off the bed. The old man's foot was caught on the railing as he hooted and hollered in agony. Dad, what happened? Tua exclaimed, running over to his father's side. It hurts! Help! It hurts! Screamed Jer over and over again. Everyone was awake at that point and rushed over to help. They even gave him some pain medicine, and after a moment, Jer drifted back to sleep. When the family questioned their father about the previous night, he had no recollection of it. The only thing he remembered was falling off the bed. Some time went by. Dialysis seemed to be going okay at first, but his health continued to decline. No matter how hard they prayed, Shojer wasn't getting any better. Seeing no improvement in his condition, the Lors decided to stop all dialysis treatments as recommended by his nurse. Jer passed away a couple of months after being put into hospice care. On one fateful night, a few weeks after Schrodinger's death, while the family was having dinner, there was a knock at the door. Shannon had her oldest son Brandon answer it. Brandon could see the silhouette of a person through the glass panel of the door as he approached. However, when he opened the door, Brandon was met with a sudden chill in the air that sent shivers down his spine. The 12-year-old scanned the front yard and dark, empty street, but didn't see anyone. He felt uneasy about it, but talked himself out from overthinking the situation. He shut the door and returned to his meal. Who was it? Shannon asked. No one, replied Brandon, sitting back in his chair. You didn't see anyone at the door? His mother asked again. No one at all? Brandon shook his head. Nuh-uh. Shannon thought it odd, but didn't think much of it. What she did not know was it would be the start of other paranormal activities to come. Tua was on his laptop working late into the night, trying hard to meet a deadline for work. It was a weeknight. He had initially stayed after work to finish, but something unexpected came up. Hungry and exhausted, he decided to take his work home to finish it there instead. The man had worked over 12 hours. He was beyond tired and was starting to doze off in front of the computer screen. Just then, Tua's cell phone rang, startling him. It was his boss. He sighed and picked up the call. This is Lore. Fine, sir. Yes, sir. I'm still on it. Uh-huh. Yes, sir. I should have it ready. Tua glanced at the clock on his computer screen. It was 2.48 a.m. I'll have it ready before lunch today. Yes. You too, sir. Tua hung up. Taking a deep breath, he closed his eyes and massaged the bridge of his nose as he exhaled slowly in an attempt to de-stress. He went back to working on his laptop, and it was five minutes into it when he heard something from outside. It sounded like something grunting or growling from the far end of the backyard, and was making its way toward him. Was it a dog? Or perhaps a boar? He thought. Whatever it was came right up to the window behind him. Curious, he got up and looked outside the window to see what it was. It was pitch black, and he couldn't see anything. The noise stopped when Tua stood by the window, only to resume again when he sat back down. The thing made its way back to the far end of the yard, then back to the window, only to go back to the far end of the yard again. It was like an animal pacing back and forth inside a cage. The strange grunting noise was starting to annoy the man. Had it been on another night, Tua would have investigated further. But there was more pressing matters at hand, such as not getting fired from his job. Tua slipped on his headphones and drowned out the sound with music as he continued working. The next day, when Kia went out to water her garden, she discovered huge paw prints going back and forth between her garden and the dining room window. She was instantly reminded of stories told by her parents and grandparents about tigers. The prints were much too large for a dog, and besides, the family didn't have one. Where could they have come from, she thought. Gia didn't see any evidence of forced entry into the yard. 
The old lady informed her son about it, but he couldn't be bothered to look into it since he was too tired and stressed from work. Ever since then, fresh tracks would appear occasionally. Some members of the family also witnessed hearing a low growling sound from the backyard late at night as well as people conversing in some unknown language. There were also incidents of unexplainable noises and sightings around the house. This terrified the family, especially the small children. It got to the point where they didn't want to go anywhere alone and followed the adults wherever they went. It was a behavior that only started after the death of their grandfather. Several prayer sessions were held at the house, specifically for the strange occurrences. The hauntings would stop only to come back again. After nearly half a year, Dolores had enough and decided to sell their house and move. They started fixing up the house and hired a contractor to make some repairs they wanted to save time on. The man and his crew showed up and started work in one of the rooms. Everything was going great until after lunch when the crew leader approached Shannon. Is everything okay? Shannon asked. She noticed the man looked frightened. Actually, ma'am, I sincerely apologize, but we were missing a certain tool needed to finish the job. We'll come back tomorrow once we get it. Again, I'm sorry for the inconvenience, the crew leader said. Oh, can you show me what you've done so far? And what's needed? Shannon asked, making her way to the room. Uh, something came up, so we really have to go. My manager will call you about it. Again, I'm really sorry, the man said and took off. The contractor never returned, and the lawyers were given back their deposit. The family again hired other contractors only to be met with a similar situation every time. Finally, they decided to get one of their relatives, who was a carpenter, to help with the repairs. The man could see nothing wrong with the work the contractor started and was confused why the others refused to take on the job. Dolores finished remodeling their house and sold it. No one really knows what became of the house or the family, but some rumors say they are still being haunted to this day. Others say it was discovered Gia, Shojo's wife, was secretly following the old religion burning incense and joss papers, which may have been the cause of the hauntings and the reason for her husband's strange behavior before his passing. Then there are people on the opposite side who argue the hauntings stopped when Gia finally decided to appease her husband's restless spirit by burning incense and joss paper. The fact is no one really knows.